applaus voor jullie. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a public conversation about our Constitution. Almost two centuries ago, Thomas Jefferson warned, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Here is today's troubling reality. In the last federal election, arguably the most exciting election in recent memory, young people with college experience were almost twice as likely to vote as those without college experience. Two-thirds of young adults with no college education failed to vote. They were disengaged from the most fundamental process of our democracy. Since there is a high correlation between education and voting, what the numbers tell us is that high school graduates are not getting the kind of civics education they need. This project is about changing that, and in a way that sets New Hampshire as a model for the nation. Tonight is the launch of Constitutionally Speaking, which is a partnership project of the New Hampshire Humanities Account, uh, Council, the New Hampshire Supreme Court Society, the University of New Hampshire School of Law, and the about-to-be-launched New Hampshire Institute for Civic Education. We're focusing on two major initiatives. The first is to reform civics education in New Hampshire's public schools so that by the time students graduate from high school, they will have gained the basic knowledge, the experience, and the inspiration to engage meaningfully in the civic lives of their communities, their state, and their nation. Good civics education much, must reach those students who will not go on to college, as well as those who will. And it must be caught, taught from kindergarten through high school. Our second goal is to encourage spirited but civil discourse and dialogue among people of all ages about the issues of our time. This is what tonight is all about. Which brings me to this illustrious audience. Margaret Warner and Justice Souter, let me introduce you to your audience. You see before you public school students and their parents and their teachers and school superintendents, a group of Hamill scholars from the University of New Hampshire are here. They're chosen, they are chosen for their community service to be Hamill scholars. There are law school students and their professors members of the state and the federal ju judiciary, civic leaders and engaged community members, friends of yours from near and far, in short, people from all walks of life and age, from youngsters to those well on their way to 100. The response to this program has been terrific, so much so that we had to move the venue here, where we have a capacity of crowd of over 1,300 people, and we had no room for several hundred more who wanted to be here. The program is being recorded, and it will be available to all New Hampshire public schools next Monday, which is Constitution Day. The video of tonight's program, as well as still photographs and other materials, will be on the Constitutionally Speaking website, which is identified in your program insert. I just want to remind you again, before we get into the program, Please turn off all of your electronic devices, all your cell phones, and please, no photographs. It is now my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Justice Souter and Margaret Warner. Justice Souter... Justice Souter, as most of you know, is a lifelong New Hampshire resident. He's a graduate of Concord High School here, and after retiring as a Justice of the United States Supreme Court, is now volunteering his time sitting on the First Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston. Margaret Warner was a member of the first class that admit, admitted women at Yale. Her early career included a stint at Foster's Daily Democrat and several years at the Concord Monitor. 
She is now a celebrated senior correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Margaret Warner and Justice Souter have been friends for years. In 1976, she interviewed David Souter, who had just been appointed New Hampshire's Attorney General. Her front page article in the Concord Monitor on January 7, 1976, appeared under the headline, New Attorney General is said to be a lawyer's lawyer. The article reported that David Souter was an in-house candidate named to the post for his intellectual and legal capabilities rather than for his political connections, and stated that his salary would be the princely sum of $25,000 to $29,000. <laughs> <laughs> I have it on good authority that the interview for that article led to a friendly back and forth between Margaret and David over the years about whose career was boosted more by that story. <laughs> Tonight's program is an unrehearsed discussion. How does the Constitution keep up with the times? Please let the dialogue begin. Thank you, Susan, so much. Thank you for that lovely, welcoming New Hampshire introduction. And thanks also to the, the four organizations that are sponsoring this. This is so important to bring us all together and the state together to celebrate the 225th anniversary of the, of the Constitution. I also want to thank all of you, this huge crowd, for being here. We continued our banter when we learned that it had sold out in two and a half hours about who was the bigger draw. Of course, it's just a suitor. <laughs> it's just a suitor. But you know, I think there is something deeper going on here, which is that everyone in this room really shares a conviction that the Constitution is, is absolutely essential to who we are today and also to, to who we are becoming and, and how important it is to really understand it and how it applies to today. So I think before we leap into the, con, the sort of uh, topic of tonight, which is how does it keep pace with the times, that we reflect just a little bit of, on its creation. Last night, I had the incredible thrill of being invited to a small event at the National Archives. And after the dinner, we were taken in for a private viewing of an original US Constitution, Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Emancipation Proclamation, and then the founding document of our founding document, the Magna Carta of 1215. And it was, as I, st especially thinking of tonight, I, I stood you know, as close as I am to you, closer to these cases, and I, it was really humbling to think of the courage that it took for the men, and, and they were all men, who had produced these, um, these documents. So, you know, today, um, something like, I looked this up, 130 countries have written constitutions. It's, and of course, many of them are honored in the breach in, in authoritarian regimes. But it's still considered a badge of honor and necessity if, you, if you're a nation that wants to call itself a democracy, which many do. But back on September 17th of 1787, when the Constitutional Convention of Philadelphia ratified, adopted, excuse me, this, this Constitution and sent it out to the states to be ratified, it was the only such document in the world that actually delineated the powers of government. And though the Bill of Rights hadn't been added at that moment, also in, inherently talked about the, the rights of citizens that had to be protected. And so Justice Souter, I thought, let's just begin with that. I mean, it was really kind of, it was a bold, it was a really radical idea. And what was it, I mean, was it an accident of history that had happened here? Or what was it about these men that both inspired them and gave them the ability to actually create a document that endures to this, to this day? Well, I, I, there are no simple explanations, I, I suppose. Uh, you can start, I, at least in my mind, I, I start with the fact that during the colonial period uh, in most of the colonies, certainly around here, uh, the colonial administration uh, was not necessarily sporadic, but not necessarily, but, but not particularly tight. Uh, and Suddenly, uh, there, there were these people uh, led by a fairly well-educated elite, and 
they got into the habit of governing themselves. Uh, there was no one to say no. Uh, the day came when, when the colonial, colonial administration tightened up uh, to begin with when they were trying to pay off the debt of the French and Indian Wars. Uh, and the, these, these people who had been so often left alone uh, uh, suddenly reacted to the tightening of, of legal control as, as tyranny. Uh, and it was frustration and disgust at the tyranny that ultimately uh, led to, to the revolution. Uh, that was then followed in, a, in effect by, by another period of disillusionment uh, because uh, finally uh, the Articles of Confederation, which was in effect a compact uh, between the, uh, the new states, uh, was, was, was ratified by enough of them to go into effect, uh, but it didn't work. Uh, the, the problem with the Articles of Confederation was uh, there was there was no central government for things that had to be done centrally. Uh, if the United States was going to be a state within the community of nations, uh, it had to be able to speak with, with one clear voice. Uh, if it was going to develop the commercial uh, basis for strength, uh, it had to have a way of, of regulating and stimulating commerce uh, beyond each individual state, which many of whom were, were, were acting as, uh, as, as traditional foreign individual states. It was perfectly clear that the United States uh, was, was simply not going to survive unless something was done to improve on the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and as I suppose everybody knows, uh, when the Convention of 1787 was called, it was not called to come up with a new constitution. Uh, the uh, sort of the, the job it was given uh, was to amend and reform and improve on the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and, and what happened uh, probably should be a lesson to us all because they got there and they just ran away with the thing. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> which isn't why few states want to have any constitutional which, conventions I was going to say, that's, that's why we haven't had another one. Uh, <laughs> but. When they, when they came to that point, and, and they, they did run away with it, um, they, they essentially had, uh, a, in addition to their frustration, they, they, had, they had two sources of inspiration. Uh, there, there really was an extraordinarily well-educated, philosophically educated uh, elite at that time that was running uh, the, the convention. Uh, they understood Montesquieu, they understood Locke, they understood the concept of separating powers so that we would not have uh, what they regarded as a, as a British kind of royal tyranny. Uh, they also had the notion uh, of, uh, uh, of a written document to constitute themselves uh, and they, they, had, they had gotten this idea in their heads simply because the colonial charters uh, and the charters, uh, the, the, the commissions to the colonial governors were written documents uh, and they purported to set out what the governor could do, what the governor could not do, what the provincial legislature could do, could not do and so on. So they had a model uh, for a written constitution. Um, and that in itself did not guarantee what we got. Uh, there, was, there, was, there was one other serious problem uh, that they simply had to work out when they got there. Uh, and uh, that was in, in James Madison's view. Uh, the most serious problem they had to get out of the way or they were going to get nowhere was the problem of how the, uh, how the individual states were going to be represented uh, in a newly formed national, national Congress. So you're saying they had uh, to compromise. They, they did, because they had, they had <laughs> big, big states versus little states. The little states, of which we have some familiarity with one, <laughs> uh, were, were afraid of being inundated uh, if, if the representation was on a pure population basis. Uh, you had the southern states with slavery, 
uh, who were scared to death that they would be inundated uh, if the population count was was simply that of, of free individuals, uh, given given the uh, the composition of, of of their their states, and the only way any constitution, and for that matter, any improvement on the Articles, uh, was really going to take place, was by a compromise uh, on on principles. Uh, didn't mean selling out, but it meant a compromise on a reasonable basis. And so we ended up with, uh, with a, a lower house represented by, uh, by uh, on a population basis. We ended up with a Senate uh, in which each state equally had two votes. That was the big and the small. Uh, we ended up with the, the compromise that looks infamous to us when we look back on it now. Uh, of, of counting uh, slaves is a, a slave is three fifths of a person in order to uh, in order to bring the southern states uh, the slave states along. So the basic lesson was a lesson of compromise that brought the the constitution to the point of uh, of signature and ultimately the nation uh, into being as we know it. And then, of course, one of the three branches of government being the Supreme Court to interpret this Constitution through the decades and, and, and the centuries. So in thinking about this discussion and the topic we're here to discuss, which is how the Constitution evolves, I did, at your suggestion, I think, go back and find this article with the help of the State Librarian of, of New Hampshire. And I'm already sorry. I <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I didn't have a copy, <laughs> or I couldn't find mine. And here's, here's what you said to me, yikes, 30, 36 years ago. I, I first wrote that your approach to the law, I said, finds its roots in the strict limits he imposes on interpreting and applying the law, and that you were critical of what you called broad interpretations of the written law, which you thought threatened sort of social acceptance, public acceptance. Here was the quote from you. The more we allow language to be debased, the more free swinging we are in our interpretation of legal language, the greater the risk we run of having the public perceive our actions as arbitrary and personal, not grounded in the constitutional process. Now, a layman reading this might think this was Antonin Scalia talking. And I, <laughs> I'm just wondering if he, would, he wouldn't. <laughs> he wouldn't. No, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> so did I have it wrong then, or has your thinking evolved since you were a 36-year-old, newly minted state attorney general? Well, the, the, I, I, I think the quotation was probably absolutely accurate, uh, but it was, it was more historic than, than you realized. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> because so far as I know, that is the only time in my life, up to then, and for that matter, since then, that I have said less than I should have. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, haven't, I haven't changed my mind about that so far as, so far as it went. Um, the, uh, the, the, the fact is, the, the meaning of the constitutional language, and, and by the way, we were, we were talking, I, I think we were talking both about statutes and constitutions mm -hmm. then, but let's just stick to the Constitution for now. The meaning of the constitutional language uh, has not changed with, with time. Uh, but what I, what I said, or what I was quoted as saying, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure that was a complete quote, uh, in effect, uh, left out something very important, uh, and it's it's really what was left out that I've spent as much time as in in the in the last 30, uh, 36 years uh, on as as on on anything at all. Uh, to to explain what I'm getting at, um, let me let me step back and, and just set a little scene. Uh, we, we have, in a way, a, a, a kind of two constitutions. We, we, we have two elements in that constitution. One uh, is, is structural. 
it constitutes the government. It says what it shall consist of. Uh, the president, two legislative houses, uh, an independent judiciary, and so on. And there are all kinds of specifications in there. The president's got to be 35 years old um, under the president's amendments. The inauguration day is January 20th, and so on. Uh, we've also got a, call it the Liberty Constitution. Um, not only the, the Liberty Bill of, Constitution. Yeah, not only the Bill of Rights, which I think everybody understands, but those portions of the original Constitution that also had the effect of guaranteeing liberty. So there's, there's one sort of dichotomy. Uh, uh, structural uh, uh, versus, uh, or as distinguished from rights. The other sort of big division that you can make in, in the Constitution is in the language as opposed to the subject matter. Uh, the Constitution has a great range of breadth of language. Uh, some of it is as specific as, as I mentioned a moment ago. 35 years old means 35 years old. If the president is 34, um, he's going to be president. Uh, some of it, however, is of extraordinary breadth. Uh, in the structural constitution, uh, it, it's, it speaks of uh, commerce among the, the states. It doesn't define it any more precisely than that. You get into the Bill of Rights, uh, you, you get terms like unreasonable searches and seizures, uh, which, which are, to, are prohibited. References to uh, the freedom uh, of speech without any further definition. Security in people's houses and so on. Uh, these general terms, I think, are, are best understood as kind of a, uh, a, a listing or a, or a menu of approved values uh, the application of which has got to be worked out over time. Uh, they couldn't be worked out at the time. Uh, the whole point of it was that it was a constitution and a bill of rights for the indefinite future. It was, like, it was not like a statute uh, which deals with a specific problem and can be amended relatively easily. The constitution cannot be amended relatively easily. So the application of these values, the, 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 the problem of trying to make them work in practice uh, was an assignment that was left to the future, to all the branches of government, for that matter, to all of the people who elect the people in those branches, and uh, ultimately, uh, when push comes to shove, uh, to, to the judicial branch, to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, does it the, give, but does it give the then, are you saying that the Supreme Court, once presented with a case, can, can find rights that aren't enumerated in the Constitution? Let's say the right to privacy, which is never mentioned and yet has been the basis of uh, decisions from whether a couple can, a married couple can use contraceptives to Roe v. Wade dealing with abortion to the recent fairly recent, I mean, 10 years ago or so, a uh, case involving the Texas anti-sodomy laws. Uh, you you got to be careful of your language and be careful of what you, what you mean by the word rights, because we use it in two different ways. Uh, let's just take speech for a minute. No question, there is a right to freedom of speech. It is an enumerated right. If you look, however, uh, at how that right was enforced, you will find uh, that the Supreme Court has held that it includes or it implies uh, a right to freedom of association because free speech doesn't mean much to people who do not have positions of power or large amounts of money to purchase broadcast time and so on. Uh, with, without, the, without the power to come together and have someone speak for them, their right to speak really isn't worth much. Uh, it makes perfect sense to say, yes, there is a right to freedom of association, 
But remember that what it is, it's a right that is recognized in order to make practical sense, in order to give practical value to the general right of speech. Uh, a great deal of what the Supreme Court does uh, and, and, and cannot avoid doing is trying to figure out how to make these things work. And the Constitution does not tell you that. Uh, so that when you then get to the, you know, the list that, that, that you came up with, and including you know, right, rights to uh, limits on, on uh, uh, prohibitions on abortion and so on, yeah, it makes perfect sense to say that they are rights, but they are rights which are, is, if, 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 if you will, the working out of applications of the rights that are specifically mentioned in the Constitution, in the abortion case, due process of law, for example. Uh, so, so, there, so there are unenumerated rights. Unenumerated. And uh, the Ninth Amendment of the Constitution speaks of them. Uh, they said, you know, the enumeration of some does not exclude uh, others that are not enumerated. But the, uh, the, the fact is that, I don't want to say there are two tiers of rights, but there, there are two concepts of rights involved here. One are the, uh, are the rights that are enumerated from which the court has to work. The other are the, are the rights that are recognized in order to make practical sense of what the Constitution says are the values that we are there to protect. And going back to that, that remark that you quoted from me, that the, 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 the point of care with language, uh, when, when that will give you an answer, uh, is, is faithfulness to the people who use the language and, uh, if you will, faithfulness to the people who are subject to the law so that they will not think that we're just coming up with great ideas of our own uh, and sort of pouring them into some vague language which we think we can twist to, 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 to mean what we want. Uh, the, the, the obligation when the, when the Supreme Court or any court is working out this how do you make it work uh, kind of problem is to explain why the court makes it work that way uh, so that it becomes apparent, we hope, uh, that we're not just putting uh, our own ideas of what might be nice uh, into, into constitutional language. But you do not think, as some believe, as Justice Scalia being one, that you can stick to what he calls the fair reading of the text, which he says basically what a reasonable reader would understand the text meant at the time of its adoption. No, you, you, you cannot stick to that. Uh, for example... Um, give us, yeah, do give us an example. Well, actually, I've, I've already given one. Nobody, nobody in his right mind uh, in 1791, when the, when the Bill of Rights was adopted, ever thought uh, that, the, that freedom of speech and freedom of association and so on, the First Amendment rights, would carry with it uh, a, a right to join organizations. It never crossed their minds. Uh, you mean and, like political parties or what kind of organizations? Uh, things like the NAACP. Yes. Uh, and uh, so that, you know, if, if, if you had said to somebody in, in 1791, after, after the Bill of Rights was ratified, you know, uh, does this speech clause cover anything but speech? They, they would have looked at you and said, you know, no speak of English. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, it says speech. But we know that, in fact, uh, if, you, if you limit it that narrowly, uh, it's not going to mean very much. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I gave, speaking of speeches, I gave a speech a couple of years ago in which I gave uh, a, another example of why simply reading doesn't do it. Uh, and, and that is, uh, if, you, if you look at the, the, the text of the, the First Amendment, um, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech and so on, uh, no law sounds pretty tough. Uh, but in fact, Everybody recognizes, conservatives, liberals, it's not an issue, that there are some laws that Congress can make that in a practical sense do limit the freedom of speech. Uh, no one doubts, for example, uh, that 
uh, if an individual uh, was poised with a microphone in his mouth uh, to divulge uh, America's nuclear secrets, uh, that he could be stopped uh, without violating uh, the First Amendment. Uh, Justice Holmes used the, the great phrase, nobody has a right to shout fire in a crowded theater, uh, which is worth remembering this evening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so that, you know, no law doesn't mean no law. Uh, and a, a third reason why, uh, why simply reading is not going to give you answers, let alone infallible answers, is that, uh, as, as that last example, I suppose, shows, um, there are legally, constitutionally recognized values that can be in conflict with each other. They both can't win all the way, all the time. Uh, and I mean, the, the paradigm examples are, are the guarantees of, of, uh, of, of, of liberty and equality. Uh, if I exercise my liberal, liberty to the greatest possible extent, uh, I can suppress um, uh, any, uh, you know, the, the rights of a lot of people. Uh, so you mean, just in, as an in, example, you uh, could, if you were a restaurant owner, you, f you would have the liberty to not serve people you didn't want to? Yeah, but... Um, but then there's... A, 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 um, an exam, maybe a, 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 an example that, that, that probably a lot of us have in our minds a lot uh, is, is the Supreme Court's uh, decision the, the year after I stepped down uh, on political campaign contributions by corporations, the so-called Citizens United uh, decision. Uh, should corporations, uh, in effect, be subject to the limitations on political expenditures that they were and, in fact, had been subject to for a century? Uh, there, was, there was a play of constitutional values going on there. Uh, if the Supreme Court uh, took a, a liberty model, uh, the liberty model uh, of free expression uh, was, yeah, corporations can spend all the money they want to in the world. If they took uh, an equality model, they would say, there's got to be uh, the possibility of a limitation on corporations so that they do not drown out other speech. Uh, the Supreme Court and Citizens United uh, went, went with the liberty model. Uh, but these, these kinds of conflicts in values are simply part of the Constitution. And you can't say that you can solve them by, simply by reading fairly the text, because if you read fairly the text, you'd have to conclude you can have it both ways all the time, and you can't. And, and the, the writers of the Bill of Rights knew that just as, just as well as we do. So there, there, there are tensions that have simply got to be resolved, and the Constitution does not have a provision in there that tells you how you're going to resolve them. So what's the public supposed to think, though, take the Citizens United case, when for, as you said, decades, Congress could impose restrictions on corporations and their political speech? and then undoes those. Uh, I'm going to take a partial pass on that, and I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why. It, it isn't because my views are supposed to be secret because I left the court. I mean, there's no question. Anybody who reads the opinions that I wrote when I was on the court on campaign finance uh, will know perfectly well that I would have gone the other way in, in Citizens United. Uh, the, the reason uh, I'm, I'm not going to go as far as, as, as I might do in answering that question uh, is that you can't get into that subject and explore it fully without getting into politics. Uh, and I am, I am a federal judge, I'm still a federal judge, uh, and there's a point beyond which uh, we do not comment uh, on, on the behavior of the political branches in their politics. Uh, that only is, is not none of our business under the, under the uh, separation of powers, uh, but uh, it's, it's a line that has to be hewed to or the court itself is going to start looking pretty, pretty political. 
So with that as a preface, I think the most I can say, but I hope enough in answer to your question, what is the public supposed to make of this? And the only answer I can give is the public uh, has got to go read the opinions. The, the question, and this goes back to something I said a minute ago, the, the question when, when you read the opinions is, do they make out a convincing argument for going this way rather than that way? And that is, that is the, the basic question whenever the court is either, either reconciling tensions within the Constitution or drawing lines when the language that the Constitution uses is very broad, like commerce power and so on, uh, do they make a convincing case that the reasons that they are giving are the real reasons? And that's, that's why, to, to just throw in a, a kind of a footnote to that, you know, we, we all hear, and for that matter, probably all of us say with, with some frequency, that judicial decisions ought to be principled decisions. Uh, that doesn't go far enough. If all you want to do is follow one of those principles or one of those statements of values that occurs in the Constitution, anybody can, can write a principal decision. If speech always wins, even though it's atomic secrets that are going to be broadcast uh, uh, to, to, uh, to our enemies, it's easy to write the decision. Speech always wins. But it doesn't. Most of the time it does, because it has very high value, but it doesn't always. Liberty doesn't always trump equality, or equality always trump liberty, and so on. Uh, and a principled decision, therefore, is not merely one that is rested on the principle that is chosen to prevail in a given case on a given day. A principled decision is one in which the court candidly and convincingly explains why this principle prevailed over that principle. It is the choice of principles that the tough, that's the tough part. And that's a choice that is made, among other things, simply on the basis of fact. We have to know how it would work out one way, how it would work out another way, and make a choice based on those predictions and on what experience teaches us from the past. Uh, but in summary, the public judgment has got to be a judgment uh, on, on whether they believe what the court says, whether they believe what the court says is convincing in making that choice between principles. Well, I will leave it there at your request on Citizens United. But let me ask you about, and this is something you talked about in your Harvard commencement speech, which caused some, I mean, the speech caused some waves. And that was, it, it dealt with racial segregation. And mm -hmm. the two very different decisions, Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, which essentially said that despite the Equal Protection Clause of, of, the, of the 14th Amendment, that um, separate railroad cars for blacks and whites was constitutional as long as they were physically similar. I'm just mm -hmm. giving a layman's view of this. And then, what, 60 years later, you have the Brown versus Board of Education decision in which a court, the court unanimously holds that, in fact, separate schools for blacks and, black and white children's, children violated the 14th Amendment. Now, I explain ha how that happened. Again, sort of what is the public to make of that? Is one wrongly decided, and then you had the court correcting it? Um, here's, here's what I make of it. Um, you know, it's very fashion. I mean, it's, 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 it's natural. I've done it myself to go around saying, you know, Plessy was wrong the day it was decided. Uh, but that, in fact, is unrealistic, uh, and, and, and I, I, I think it's unfair. Uh, uh, the, the issue in Plessy was really just like the issue in, in Brown. The fact that one was on railroad cars and one was about school buildings and so on uh, doesn't make any difference. Um, and the issue that 
sort of never got stated exactly because nobody really had it expressly in mind was, what are the facts that we ought to consider in deciding whether there is equality or not? What Plessy said was, we're going to consider the, the kind of objective, physical, measurable facts. Are the railroad cars really the same? Do the same upholstery on the seats, etc., things like that. They took kind of a, a, a formalistic, physical view of it. When Brown came along, uh, the court said, this was, this was the great summary line in Brown. The court said, uh, separate schools are inherently unequal. Even if they're exactly the same in, you know, per square foot building costs and textbooks used and so on, there is an inherent equality uh, in, the in, in the enforced segregation under law. The big difference was uh, that what, what the Brown case saw as the facts were not simply you know, the, the measurable things like uh, nice buildings and, and clean textbooks. They looked beyond the, the measurable facts to what the facts meant. And they knew that those facts meant to anybody, whether white or black, that the people who made the law and enforced it were enforcing separation because they believed that the black group was not as good as the white group. And that's why they said the very fact of separa or mandated separation was inherent inequality. Uh, was the court in Plessy dishonest or stupid or demonstrably wrong when it didn't look to meaning. Uh, and this is where I, I think one has to have some political perspective. Because what we can see changes over time depending on our experience. And I, I said in, in the speech that you referred to, Margaret, I, 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 I reminded everybody that the court that decided Plessy and Ferguson in 1890 uh, consisted of judges who remembered uh, slavery. And if you remembered slavery, the idea that there was a constitutional guarantee that the formerly enslaved population and their children and grandchildren were entitled to exactly equal facilities on a railroad with the formerly dominant white population. That looked like real progress. You won't find that statement in Plessy, but with a little perspective, it's, it's not hard to see that. And therefore, what the Brown court said was inherent inequality did not leap out at them. Uh, and in fact, the, um, the, the, the famous dissenter in Plessy, the first Justice, uh, Justice Harlan, Harlan. Uh, he, he based his dissent on, on, a, on a strictly literal reading of, of the word, uh, word equal. He said uh, it means colorblind, which has never been the law. Uh, but the, the court in, in Brown v. Board of Education, as you said, it had 60 years since Plessy, and it had 90 years since the end of slavery. And it no longer had the background of slavery to look at equal, at, 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 at physically equal facilities and say, hey, this is great. We're making real progress. What, in fact, uh, it had was a, 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 a concept of slavery as something that happened long before we were here. And it was obvious to them that the only reason for continuing the segregation was to enforce a, a, a judgment of inequality. Um, what changed uh, was the way they looked at the facts. The concept of equality, uh, I, I suppose, did not change, although the application of that concept certainly changed because they could see something 
that their predecessors simply didn't see. And that's why when, 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 when we say, you know, if you want to know what the, what the provision uh, means in practice, you've got to see how the court implements it. You've got to see how it, how it works in a given fact situation. What we learn from Brown is that the facts can include the meaning of facts as people experience them, as long as we have the eyes to see that. And our capacity to see that changes over time, and it changed over the time between Plessy and Brown. Does our capacity to see it change, or does also the meaning of this does it change for people living in that time? In other words, to what degree is it, should justices be sensitive or reflect the social realities of the time? Uh, you know, the word, the word should is, 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 is tough to deal with here. Uh, or is it just uh, that they do? No, but I, I was gonna, that's basically what you get to. Um, we can only see what our experience has opened our eyes to. And one reason you have nine people on the Supreme Court rather than one uh, is, is not merely, once again, to divide power, but because among nine people, there are gonna be those who can see things that others don't. And if they can convince the others of what they see, they may very well affect the result in a case. Uh, but that's, that's, that's why you want a lot of eyes and a lot of minds, uh, because we don't all see the same things, because we have not all had the same experience. I'll, I'll give you an example from, from my personal life. Um, one, of the, one of the problems that the Supreme Court dealt with in sort of the last decade. Let me interrupt you for one sec. While um, you're finishing your answer, we are going to go to questions from the audience. And so the time is running away from us. So we have two mics here and here, and would anyone like to ask a question? They could just come and get ready to ask it. I think the first three positions here have been reserved for some students, so no pressure on anyone, but feel free to come forward, and, and uh, anyway, go ahead. Now you know what I meant when I said that was the only time I said less than I could have. <laughs> uh, Where were we? <laughs> you were talking about, I, I had asked whether justices just either necessarily oh. do or should reflect the social you know, realities. You might tell I, a story from I your... was getting into my story. Yes. Uh, <laughs> one of the issues that the court dealt with uh, at great length in the last 10 years that I was on the court uh, was uh, the, the, the right of jury trial uh, and what can be done to affect the conduct of trials uh, that either is consistent or inconsistent with it. Uh, we got into that problem because uh, in, the, in the war on drugs, Congress was increasingly leaving it to the judges rather than to juries to make the findings of fact on which there would be enormous differences in potential uh, prison sentences. And the question was, uh, does, does that in effect, inhibit the right or, or limit uh, the legitimate right of jury trial. Uh, I came down on, on the side of saying, uh, ultimately, yes, it does. And the rule that finally was evolved was, uh, and it's, it's another how to do it rule, you won't find it written in the Constitution anywhere, but the rule it came out with is that any finding of fact that increases the possible range of sentences is a fact that must be found by a jury rather than by a judge. I have no doubt whatsoever that I could see the problem easier because I had been a trial judge in the state of New Hampshire for five years and I had conducted a lot of jury trials and after every single one of those jury trials, I always sat down and I always talked with the jurors. Uh, and I came away from that experience uh, with a respect for the, for the integrity of jurors and the jury system, which I could never have had 
any other way. I came to realize that any cynical talk about, you know, juries will do, uh, they'll convict whether it's reasonable doubt or not, those, those cynical thoughts are totally off base. Uh, and uh, I also had experiences here with a grand jury in which there were points in which the grand jury thought it could sniff politics into a request for an indictment and it would dig in its heels. Uh, so I came away from my experience as a trial judge with an enormous respect for the jurors and for the crucial importance of the jury system. In effect, I was saying, we're not going to take any chances in eliminating too much of the jury right. That is an example of how a judge's experience determines what a judge can see, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hence how a judge answers the question, how do we make this right, jury in this case, practically significant to real people? Interesting. Uh, this right here, do you want to start? Um, and if you just please just give us your name and where you're from or where you go to school. And I'm Joe Fahey. I'm from Bedford, and I attend Trinity High School. Um, if you were still a member on the Supreme Court, how would you have voted on the um, national health care reform law? Ooh. <laughs> Going to take a pass on that one, too. <laughs> No, wait a minute, don't go away, don't go away. I'm, 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 I'm going to say more. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's uh, appropriate for, for retired justices to go around second-guessing what their colleagues uh, uh, ultimately did. Uh, but I want to use your question, uh, nonetheless, to, to kind of illustrate again something, uh, something that, 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 that I had said earlier. I had said earlier that the way we give effect to these values, which are left to be worked out later, and the way sometimes uh, we, we have to resolve tension between competing values, uh, determines, is, is, is determined by our analysis of the facts uh, and what might happen one way, what might happen another way. The healthcare decision. Uh, presents a, a good example of that because there was a majority, as, as I'm, I'm sure you know, there was a majority of five people who felt that mandating health care was not regulating commerce. It really was forcing people into commerce who were not already there. That was a fact issue. Uh, the fact that the majority of five emphasized was uh, these people are not in commerce because they're, they're not now buying insurance. They're not now covered by insurance. And, and our notion of commerce, in fact, in this area, uh, is, is commerce in, in the actual provision of insurance for health care. The argument on the other side was of course these presently uninsured people are in commerce. They're in commerce because whether they are insured or not, sooner or later they're going to need a doctor. And I, I forget whether anyone specifically mentioned this, but we all know that if, if, if you don't have a doctor and you don't have insurance and you're in trouble, you're going to go to the emergency room of the nearest hospital and it's going to take you in and, and it's, it's going to treat you. Uh, the, the commerce of health care, therefore, included the uninsured on this view just as much as the insured. But what it was, was an argument about facts and an argument about how to characterize, how to see these facts. It was the same kind of argument uh, that, if, if you will, went on between the, 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 the view of equality in Plessy and Ferguson, which says, look, we just look to the, uh, to the, to the railroad cars or to the bricks and mortar. 
uh, and, and, and the view of approaching the facts in Brown. We look to the, to the meaning of it. But it was an argument about fact. And so the, the health care decision on that particular issue of commerce is a good illustration of why you cannot decide these issues, no matter what the language is. You cannot decide them uh, without deciding how you're going to view the facts. Thank you. So that isn't what you asked for, but I hope <laughs> you'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm uh, Alex Rose from Exeter High School, and so my question is, when and if the marriage equality law becomes um, available for the Supreme Court, how do you think they will rule, and why? <laughs> I wish I'd started with you all sooner. <laughs> I'll, t I'll tell you a story about two friends of mine. Two of my closest friends in, in college have maintained a close friendship. They were roommates. One of them uh, was an investment banker who actually died last year, and the other one uh, was, uh, was an Episcopal, or is an Episcopal priest. And their families would get together every summer and spend a long weekend together. And the son of the investment banker uh, told me that uh, the way they started off their conversation every year was the same way. Uh, the priest would say to his investment banker roommate, he'd say, uh, he said, what's the market going to do? <laughs> and the investment banker would say, I have no idea. And he would then turn to the priest and he would say, what's God going to do? <laughs> and the priest would say, I have no idea. <laughs> you got your answer. <laughs> In the discussion of the rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights, um, it often comes up, and the best example I can give is um, the recent decision of D.C. v. Heller. Um, whether I'm sorry, the, uh, which decision? The District of Columbia versus Heller. Um, the the, gun, uh, gun the gun Second, Amendment. Second Amendment. Second Amendment. Yes. Yeah. Um, it often comes up whether these rights are purely um, for the individual or if they are a more communal um, collective right. Um, what would your opinion be on that? Well, I gave my opinion on that uh, because I, w I was on the court when, uh, when, when, the, uh, when the case was decided. Why don't you briefly um, tell people the oh, I'm, case? Oh, I'm sorry. The, 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 the issue uh, under, under that and a subsequent Second Amendment case was whether the, uh, the, the, the Second Amendment guarantee <coughs> excuse me, of a right to bear arms uh, was the right of any individual, no matter what his position or business in life, uh, to, uh, to carry firearms, uh, or whether, in fact, uh, it was a right that uh, the guarantee was limited to the, the use of firearms uh, in what used to be called the, the militia. Uh, we, would, we would refer to it today as the, you know, the National Guard or the, or the Armed Forces. And uh, as, I, as I said, I, and, and the, the, the case came up to the court because the District of Columbia had fairly strict uh, regulations of the, of the right to carry firearms. And an individual who believed that his right to have a firearm in his house ready to go uh, had been infringed, and it certainly had been limited, uh, raised the question uh, of, of whether it was an individual right uh, or whether it was a right that only pertained to people when they were carrying arms uh, as, as part of the, in effect, the, the national defense. And the, the court went five to four on that, uh, and it held that it was an individual right. I, I was in the dissent on that. Uh, the dissent was written by Justice Stevens, and I, of course, think that Justice Stevens had the, had the better part of, of, of the argument. Uh, the, the, the reason that I guess I, I haven't changed my mind uh, on it uh, is really the reasons that Justice Stevens gave. I didn't write a separate opinion on it. Uh, but just to simply to, to indicate why I thought, frankly, that it was so obvious 
that the Stevens view was the better view uh, was that the, the, the Second Amendment is, is written uh, with a first clause uh, that refers to the, uh, to the need to have, uh, or the value of having a well-regulated militia. Therefore, the right to bear arms shall not be infringed. I'll be honest with you, I don't see today any more than I saw then how you can read that language and not say they wouldn't have put the militia clause at the beginning of the sentence if they were trying to provide a right that had no relation to the militia and to carrying arms for that reason. Uh, and as, as, as I guess you probably know, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you've probably read the opinions, uh, the, the opinions on each side, Justice Stevens's opinion for the dissent, which I joined, Justice Scalia's for the, for the majority, were very heavy on history to try to figure out, try to make a case for what the original understanding of the clause was. Uh, but I've got to say, I'm, I'm certainly unrepentant. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, Thank you. I'm Alec Medine from Gilmanton, and I go to Guilford High School. And what, where do you stand on states and their abilities to nullify federal law? I, I guess that's kind of a softball question. <laughs> uh, 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 we fought a civil war about that. Uh, and, and the nullification side lost. And the nullification argument is no better today uh, than it was uh, in 1860. Uh, when the Congress of the United States is acting within its powers, it is, acting, it is, it is providing law that prevails over any law of the states. We have an express supremacy clause in the Constitution that the, that the acts of Congress, treaties, etc., shall, shall be the supreme law of the land along with the Constitution itself. Uh, if there is an argument as to whether Congress is acting within its powers, that's what constitutional cases are made of. In cases like that, if there is a serious question, can ultimately get to the Supreme Court, and if the Supreme Court thinks Congress went too far, went beyond the powers that are reasonably understood to have been given to it in Article I. It will say so, uh, and the statute will go down the drain. If it doesn't say so, it is the supreme law of the land, and under the Constitution of the United States, no, no state has a right to nullify it. Were you thinking of a particular case? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just in general. Does anyone Thank else you. have a question? Oh, good, great. Hi, I'm Debbie Skiri, and I'm from Wyndham. And my question tonight is really around where we started this conversation, which was really around the schools. Uh, uh, around the what? Schools. Oh. Uh, and we've, I've heard a lot this evening about democratic principles, um, civic engagement. And I guess I'm wondering, uh, Justice Souter, if you could share with us your thoughts about what the appropriate role and probably responsibility as well of our schools to produce civically engaged students? Well, I'll, I'll have to be careful of that one because I, I could talk even longer on that than on some of the other things <laughs> that I, I, I've talked on. But uh, I'll, I'll start with the bottom line. I don't believe there is, there is any problem of, of, of American politics and American public life uh, which is more significant today uh, than the pervasive civic ignorance of the Constitution of the United States and the structure uh, of government. Uh, I hope every one of you runs for the legislature. Uh, the <laughs>
I, I, I won't spend a lot of time on statistics. But we, we know with pretty reliable evidence that two-thirds of the people in the United States do not know that we have three separate branches of government. Uh, I remember, and I, 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 could, I don't know the name of it, but I can remember hearing about a survey back four or five years ago in which a substantial percentage of Americans believed that the Supreme Court of the United States was a committee of the Congress. Um, it didn't used to be this bad. Uh, when I was in school, we, we had actually, in the course of high school, there were two required civics courses. Uh, when we got out of high school, we may not have known a lot, uh, but we, we at least had a basic understanding of the structure uh, of American government, the structure of state government, for that matter. And what that gave us was not only a kind of a, a, a framework to, to hang the other thing, hang on the, the, the things that we learned later. It gave us a, a basic sense of where responsibility lies for given problems within the government. And a corollary of that was we, we certainly understood where responsibility lay uh, in matters that with the business of the legislative branch or the, or the Congress of the United States. Uh, and we knew that we could influence that by voting. Uh, today, that I, I, I don't believe there would have been any two-thirds ignorance rule uh, back at that time. Starting about 1970, uh, the teaching of civics uh, went into decline from which it has never significantly covered, recovered. The good news, I know simply from, from what I've learned in New Hampshire, is there are a lot of terrific civics teachers uh, in New Hampshire uh, who are trying to turn that around. Uh, one of their problems is that they don't necessarily have the, the material support to do it very well, and the demands on teaching, and this includes the demands that are imposed by the No Child Left Behind rule, makes it very difficult to find the time for more civics. But the reason I, I, I said that I think it is the most significant problem that we've got uh, is that I think some of the aspects of current American government that, that people on both sides find frustrating are in part a, uh, a, a function uh, of the inability of people to understand how government can and should function. Uh, it, is, it is a product uh, of civic ignorance. What I worry about uh, is, uh, is, is a remark that Benjamin Franklin made, and uh, Susan, Susan Leahy quoted Jefferson at the beginning about how uh, an, an ignorant people can never remain a free people. Democracy cannot survive too much ignorance. Franklin, uh, in effect, had, uh, had a comment to which the Jefferson comment is a kind of an answer or a response. And I, you probably have heard this, but it bears repeating. Uh, Franklin was asked by someone, I think, on the streets of Philadelphia shortly after the 1787 convention adjourned, what kind of government the Constitution would give us if it was adopted. And Franklin's famous answer was, uh, a republic if you can keep it. You can't keep it in ignorance. I don't worry about our losing republican government in the United States because I'm afraid of a foreign invasion. I don't worry about it because I think there is going to be a coup by the military as has happened in some other places. What I worry about is that when problems are not addressed, people will not know who is responsible. And when the problems get bad enough, as they might do, for example, with another serious terrorist attack, as they might do with another financial meltdown, some one person will come forward and say, give me total power and I will solve this problem. That is how the Roman Republic fell. Augustus became emperor not because he arrested the Roman Senate. 
he became emperor because he promised that he would solve problems that were not being solved. If we know who is responsible, I have enough faith in the American people uh, to demand performance from those responsible. If we don't know, we will stay away from the polls. We will not demand it. And the day will come when somebody will come forward and we and the government will in effect say, take the ball and run with it. Do what you have to do. Uh, that is the way democracy dies. And if something is not done to improve the level of civic knowledge, that is what you should worry about at night. So to end where I began, uh, the, the support of civic education in the United States, including in this state, uh, is, is a public problem and a public responsibility which is second to none. But, by the way, that was not a planted question, but I am sure glad she asked it. <laughs> we are so close to having to end that I'm going to suggest that two of you come to the mic and maybe just both ask your questions, just because I, there's some, there are people waiting to ask, and we are almost out of time. So, sir, would you like to come, to, and maybe could you both, is that all right, Justice Souter? You're the boss. Well, okay, we'll get to, <laughs> we'll have two questions. My name is Carl Woodbury. Um, from uh, Concord High School, although not recently. Uh, I know what it's like. <laughs> First of all, let me uh, say that I uh, personally want to thank you for your contribution to this country, and you've always made me proud that I'm from New Hampshire. Although, although I, I have to, I, although I, I have to admit, I, I, I really thank did you, come but to see I will Margaret, remind uh, you that I was also the luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> although I have to admit, I really did come to see Margaret. Um, <laughs> uh, you want to be on the Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, my question is uh, somewhat vague. Uh, hopefully, uh, my vague description of this case will trigger your memory. There was an eminent domain case that you ruled on, I think, in the, in the majority. <laughs> Uh, where a, a city was allowed to take uh, private property to then resell to uh, a private developer. Could you comment on that case and the reasons for your ruling? Uh, I, uh, I, my house got picketed as a result of that case. <laughs> and I didn't write the opinion. Justice Stevens wrote it. <laughs> and I, I mean, I joined it. Uh, but Justice Stevens wrote the opinion. I called Justice Stevens up. And I said, they ought to be picketing you, not me. <laughs> uh, but that case is, is fascinating, not for what it held, but for the way it was perceived. Uh, the issue in that case uh, revolved around the, the doctrine that when the state uses an eminent domain power to take property from someone, which it must pay fair value for, but when it uses its eminent domain power to take that property, the power is limited to takings which are for public uses. And the question was, basically, uh, if, the, if the property ultimately, after it is taken by the government, is either then resold or, or devoted to uses that allow for private profit making, does that take the government's act of, of eminent domain in taking that property outside the sphere of public use or public purpose. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the court, and it was not unanimous, by the way, but the majority of the court <coughs> held, no, it doesn't do that. Uh, a good example uh, uh, are, are all the, uh, the, the high tension lines in the state, uh, all the railroad lines in the state throughout the country. Most of them were not taken by voluntary uh, sales. Huge amounts of that property were taken by eminent domain and then uh, given to utility companies and railroads and so on so that they could string their lines. 
the, the, the ultimate public purpose was to provide electricity and transportation and so on to the public uh, in general. Uh, but there was a, a, a private uh, uh, component ultimately to the ownership in order to get there. Well, that's all, that's all uh, the, the, the case held. What is fascinating to me is that people did not understand that that's what the law had always been. There was nothing new about the majority holding uh, in, by the Supreme Court. What was new was the kind of challenge that was made. Uh, it was a property right challenge that had not been around before. But the, the opinion uh, apparently did not succeed in making it clear that what the court was doing, the court majority was doing, was st sticking to the old law of the Constitution as it had always, always been. And the moral of the story is, if, if the case gets reported generally uh, with that kind of misunderstanding in it, uh, you'd never get the misunderstanding uh, corrected. And it, there, was, there, was a, there was a lesson in that uh, uh, for, for all of us. Um, I, I, I know I, I, have, I have a few bright spots despite the, the reaction to the thing. Uh, I, I was talking to one of my neighbors about, I don't know, a month or six weeks after it happened. And, and by the way, the, the opinion came down at the end of the term, and so I was back in New Hampshire pretty soon, and, and literally there were some people picketing my house. Um, and um, my neighbor knew it, and of course uh, some press showed up to televise the people who were picketing, and uh, some members, I think some from the Boston press, happened to, to talk to one of my neighbors. And I was talking with her afterwards, and she said, you know, I don't, I don't think they ought to bother you like that, but she said, after all of that, she said, I went onto the internet and I read the opinion that you joined. And she said, you guys didn't say what they're saying you said. Uh, and I said, yeah, that's right. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I, 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 said, I said, you're one in a million. Uh, and, uh, but that, that shows you what can happen if, if you don't make your, your, your explanation clear. We got one more so to go. We, yes, but, but, then, but you had a couple closing thoughts you wanted to leave us with. So it's sort of your choice, but we have this young man here dying to ask a question. <laughs> if, if it helps, if you I'm going to graduate from UNH Law. So if, you will ask a, if you will ask a short question, I'll be able to squeeze in an answer and a couple of thoughts of my own to close. How about that? Make it a quick one. I think a lot of my professors behind me just groaned at the thought of me asking a, a short question. Uh, well, she's groaning at the idea of mine giving a short answer. These students here did a fabulous job. So. <laughs> I did uh, wonder if you could speak briefly about the importance of diversity on the bench uh, for the Supreme Court in the fact that in the past 10 years, 20 years, there's been more diversity on the Supreme Court than there ever has been before. And if you could sp speak briefly about the benefits of diversity to the judicial system. There are, there are a couple of benefits. Uh, let me start off with, with one that I think is not a clear benefit. Uh, and I believe me, I, I have the, uh, the agreement of, of uh, some of the women on the court for this, uh, or I wouldn't dare say it. But I don't know that in the time, for example, that I sat on the court with Justice O'Connor, with Justice Ginsburg, that there was a, a kind of feminine approach to the law that was different from the approach of the rest of us. Uh, the value of the diversity, however, uh, I, I guess is twofold. Um, one is something that I've already touched on, uh, and that is uh, the more diverse the background, uh, or the backgrounds, plural, the more likely we are to have somebody on the court who can see things that some of those people don't see and say, hey, wait a minute, you're missing something when we sit down to discuss the cases. Uh, and in effect, any form of diversity contributes to that. The other great benefit uh, is that uh, sort of the, the old notion of, of, of a place at the table. Uh, the people of the United States now realize uh, that 
there is a place for all sorts of people in the population. Uh, the court is no longer a masculine institution, for example. When Thurgood Marshall went on the court, suddenly it was apparent uh, that it was, the, it was a court for black judges as well as white ones. When Sonia Sotomayor went on the court, uh, it was a court for people with Hispanic background as well as Anglo-Saxons and so on. Uh, the, the realization that the Supreme Court comes from the people and ultimately will go back to the people uh, is, is part of its legitimacy. Uh, it, is, it is part of the basis for trust. Uh, so uh, God bless the diversity on the Supreme Court. <laughs> I love it. I'll be fast. So, so just in closing, do you, uh, from what you said to the answer of the civic education question, do you think we're losing our ability, which has always animated, you know, our, our belief in our constitution and our country, that we are always perfecting our democracy? Uh, I don't think we have lost it. I think it is in jeopardy. I am not a pessimist, but I am not an optimist about the future of American democracy. We have got to get a hold on some of the problems, and, and they, are, they are political uh, uh, more than constitutional problems. But if they are not dealt with, e.g. civic education, the political problems are going to turn into constitutional problems. Uh, so I, uh, my belief is uh, you know, we're, we're, we're still in the game, uh, but we have serious work to do, and it is serious work that is, it is being neglected right now. Or so has do, been neglected. do you think that we still have the capacity to do what the what the, fa the framers did, which was to to compromise in in furtherance of solving some of these huge problems? I would like to think that enough example of non compromise uh, is is going to start people thinking that there must be there must be a better way to to try to govern the country. Well, Justice Souter, thank you for a really fascinating conversation and one that I'm sure will, everyone out here is going to run out and read their constitution and maybe read some of those rulings. And for, for a final uh, word from Susan Leahy. Thank you, Susan. Let me say a tremendous thank you to both of you for a most engaging and spirited yet civil dialogue about the constitution. This was really fun uh, and time flew. I also would like to thank those of you who participated in the Q&A. It really enlivened the evening, I think. And finally, we do have uh, some support uh, that has helped make this possible. And I want to thank both the John Hoffman Family Foundation and the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation for their support tonight. And I want to note that the Charitable Foundation's support is to promote civic engagement and is from the Lou Feldstein Public Issues Fund. Let me also end by saying, constitutionally speaking, is, is a year-long project. This is the pilot year. There's going to be a symposium at the University of New Hampshire School of Law on November 17th to further explore the constitutional subjects discussed this evening and to prepare educators and community leaders to bring conversations like this to their schools and to local communities. Um, and there's going to be a finale on May 17th of 2013, and that's going to be a public conversation with David Boys and Ted Olson. These preeminent constitutional litigators argued opposing sides of Bush versus Gore before the United States Supreme Court in 2001, and more recently argued California's gay marriage case before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now it is my pleasure to invite our wonderful audience to continue tonight's conversation in Governor's Hall at the back of the theater. Um, back uh, in Governor's Hall, we have the Supreme Court Society's new exhibit entitled New Hampshire and the United States Supreme Court. 
One of the panels features the 1977 United States Supreme Court case Woolley versus Maynard. David H. Souter was on brief as New Hampshire Attorney General for the uh, police chief, Woolley, and Margaret Warner reported the case for the Concord Monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Please continue the conversation in Governor's Hall. Thank you.